Hello, welcome. This is Corey from the Boss Scholar YouTube channel. I'm glad you could join me today. I'm going to explain to, to the best of my abilities and the best of my knowledge, Bach's table of ornaments and how it applies to various pieces that I've selected here. But before I get to the topic on hand, I just have a few house cleaning items to, uh, to go over. First of all, my wife Marilyn and I are still having a waiting list for summer piano lessons. So if you're interested in, in beginning piano lessons in June, and you, you're welcome to continue on into the fall uh, if you'd like, and also into the next year if you like taking from us, just simply click on the link below, go and sign up with a first come first serve on our summer waiting list. This does not include current students. So if you're a current student of us studying, you don't have to worry about it, your slot is secure. This is just for new people who are interested in studying with us. Also, I'd like to bring to your attention the Well-Rounded Pianist. It's my own tutorial site in which I upload new material weekly, uh, material that is not on YouTube. So you're welcome to go over to the Well-Rounded Pianist and join if you'd like. Uh, very, very affordable memberships there. And you can learn from me uh, on, at your own pace uh, from, from video instruction. The third thing I want to bring to your attention is Sight Reading and Harmony. The world is, is buzzing about this great book here, Sight Reading and Harmony. It's been out since, since 2017. It is my flagship publication with Box Scholar Publishing, my own publishing company. Sight Reading and Harmony. People around the world are raving about it. Go and check it out, look at the reviews on Amazon, and get one of these, either hard copy or, or PDF, and you will never regret it. Everyone talks really highly about this book, and I'm really happy and proud about that. So um, I have a couple of things printed out here. I'm going to have this little table of ornaments here on the upper uh, right hand of the screen, so you can always refer to that. But if you'd like to print these out, there is an original box table of ornaments that looks like this. And you can just, all you have to do is go to Google Images, put Bach Table of Ornaments, and you'll find Bach's own Table of Ornaments right here. And then uh, I have another sort of one uh, translated into English and made a little neater looking like this, but it's exactly Bach's Table of Ornaments. This particular one comes from Music Stack Exchange. Music Stack Exchange. So th this is the one I'm going to put up in the upper right hand of the video so you can refer to that as I am talking about these uh, these ornaments. The scores I'm using, I'm using three different Urtext editions. I am using uh, the Baron Reiter Urtext edition for box partitas. Looks like that. I am using the uh, uh, Peter's edition for Box French Suites. It looks like this. I know the cover has come off, so there's no Peter's green Peter's cover on there. But that is the French Suites in Peter's. And I wanted to use my Peter's edition of the Goldberg variations, but I couldn't find it. I don't know, it's lost somewhere. So I'll use my own. <laughs> so I have my own Urtex edition of Box Goldberg variations. If you don't have one of these, you may want to get one. And I'm going, and basically I, I, all my ornaments on here are pretty much the same as the ornaments you'll find in most other Urtext editions. The first uh, ornament we have here is a trill. And that's just a trill, it's just a bunch of squiggly lines. Sometimes though, composers, or especially Bach, sometimes he was very particular about if he just makes just a tiny, flourish like that. It's usually just like either or like a short trill. That's what would be called a crawl triller in German, just a short trill. But sometimes they, uh, Bach will, will extend the, the squiggly lines and make them a little bit longer. So it's not, won't be so short, it'll be a little bit longer. That's a good case where you would want to extend the trill you know, where you want to play more notes in the trill, usually say eight notes if they're like equivalent to 30 second notes. So there are slight 
deviations or slight variants of that just a normal trill. And this trill here, I have a couple examples here. I'm going to turn to French Suite number two, the Allemande. So here is a trill. I'll play it here. That E flat right there has a little trill on it. That's a small trill, a crawl triller. I would suggest, and Bach doesn't say this in the table of ornaments, but it is, mm, I would say many experienced performers actually would agree with me on this. I actually got this idea from a couple of my professors in college and graduate school. So this is just not my own crazy idea, but okay. Regarding whether the trill should start from the upper note or on the note, and that's always a raging debate among pianists. Here is the general rule that I follow for that. Bach doesn't state this though in his ornament table. If you take Bach's ornament table, you would think you would think the note the trill always starts on the note above the trill note above the auxiliary note the main note but i believe and, and many many professional pianists also believe that if the note before the trill is already the upper note then you don't need to play it again because it becomes redundant. So let me show you an example. So here I'm going to play this trill the literal way, playing it from the upper note. I don't suggest to do it that way. I suggest to, to only have three notes in this type of trill because the note previously is already the upper note. So you don't have to over trill on this type of trill because this type of trill only takes place during one sixteenth note. So once again, some people would call that an inverted mordant because mordants go down rather than up and I'll show you that in a minute. So that's a good example of just a short trill, a prowl triller. And another good example of that is in the courant. Let's turn to the courant of the same suite, measure 37. left the trill out just for, for a reason. So let's do that again. So Bach has a trill on that A flat right there. So the note before that A flat is not B, B flat. So if the note before the A flat were B flat, It would be or or that. If the note before the trill were B flat, you probably would want to start the trill on A flat, so you wouldn't have to double play the B flat. But since in this case it's not B flat, it's D flat, and there's a jump down to it. In this case, it's perfectly fine and recommended to play the trill beginning on the upper note. So we have. could go you can extend it a little bit and do it literally like Bach says here in the table so using the table literally it would be let's see yeah one two three four five six so there would be a total of six notes including that last note you're holding so you can either do that or or you can shorten it like that. I think either of those is fine, but if you want to take it literally, it would be, it would be that. But remember, this is a good example where you have that trill, that the trill, I would suggest to not start on the note, to start from the upper note. 
as Bach says in the order. Another example here is in partita number four. So let's look at partita number four, the Cerebon, right at the very beginning in measure two. You'll see in this case, a good or text should have a slur. So Bach has, you have, he has a D, and then he has, he has a D, and he has a slur, an actual, it's Bach slur, not the editors. It's a slur going from D to C sharp, and the C sharp has a little trill, one of those prawl trillings. This is an excellent example where you definitely would not want to play the upper note before the trill because that slur indicates and, and indicates a D crescendo. It's, so I'll, I'll play it without the trill. It would be like that. Now I'll play it with a, a trill with just three notes on the trill. It's, it's just going to go C sharp up to D, back to C sharp. Now, you get more of an effect of that psi motive kind of effect or the D crescendo effect if you play, if you do that. If you do this, if you play it like that from the upper note, it ruins the whole D crescendo effect. Okay, let's go on to the mordant. The next note over, uh, the next indication over is a mordant. Very simple, mordant is the, mo the simplest kind of ornament, the most famous ornament in history. most famous ornament or mordant in history. The, so Bach just wrote an A in his, his organ uh, toccata, and he just put a little thing with a line through it. So whenever that little trill uh, squiggly line has a line through it, it's always a mordant, and it's always played to the bottom going up. Trills are played from the note going up. So, so let's take the, let's take the famous more than in the toccata. If it were a trill, it would be either either that or or that or or that. So a good example of a mordant here is French suite number three, uh, the allemand. It's a good example. Right in the very beginning, we have uh, the the incomplete measure in the beginning, the three notes. And then, then you have your mordant right there at the beginning of measure one. And then he does it also in the left hand. He has, not yet. He has one there. So he has one in the left, right hand, and one in the left hand in the same measure. And that sounds like this. If you want to slow it down, if you slow it way down, it'll be pretty much so pretty much when you get to the when you get to the last note, the third note of the mordant, then that will come about the, the same time as your first sixteenth note in the left hand after that sixteenth rest. slowly it would sound like that not not because if you do that the, the mordant is too fast for the speed of the music so if you play it at the correct or a, a good speed a more correct speed notice I play I play this this F sharp the same time as I played the third note here. In other words, mordants are always played on the beat, not before the beat. Let's look over to the next uh, example here, trill with termination. So it's a longer trill.
trill. It's a longer squiggly line with a little mordant thing at the end with a line going through it. So literally, that's, I'm gonna play what they have here. You would have that. So you have your trill, and then you have, you have like your mordant at the end. So it's like a trill with a mordant at the end, which is simply called a trill with termination. But it's interesting because they're not always notated this way. Actually, Bach usually notates it another way. If you turn to partita number four, let's turn to first the minuet. Ah, very first note has a mordant on it here. We're not talking about mordants, but this one has a mordant, so. There's another mordant there, so it has, I should have used this for my mordant example, actually. But yeah, what I wanted to say, oh, this is in measure one, two, four, measure four. Okay, look at measure four. In measure four, Bach has, after these triplets, he has an E, half note E, going down, uh, resolving to a D, and uh, above the half note E, he has just, uh, he has a trill with termination, like this third example right here. So that is played, uh, if we take literally what he says here, we don't have to do any manipulation or anything. We're going to take literally what he has here. It's going to sound in a, like this. And I'm, I'm going to play it from the upper note. I'm going to play it starting the trill from the F sharp, even though my rule says you probably shouldn't do that. Then I'm going to do it the other way too. So we have... It actually sounds very... It's almost like Mozart. Bach wanted, I think he wanted to write it something a little more uh, modern sounding, something a little more, more sounding like maybe that his son C.T.E. Bach would have written. It sounds like just a normal kind of classical style trill that, we, that you would do in Mozart. I'll play this whole phrase here. <laughs> So you can either go, that's a trill, the literal trill with termination, as Bach explains in this table, or if you want to start the trill on the E, that's perfectly fine also. But if you do that, you're going to hold the E a little bit longer. You're going to hold the E for two trill notes. So it would be... So you can either go... Or you can go either one of those would be in my opinion would be acceptable for this trill here but what would not be acceptable is this and that would not be acceptable and that's wrong and it sounds ridiculous because the trill is much too fast for the speed of the music and that's another point I want to make. I don't think I've made this point yet, but I always emphasize this with my piano students that ornaments should be proportionally as proportionally to the speed of the music. So if you're practicing slowly, which I'm doing here in the minuet, this isn't up to speed. I'm playing it a little slow so you can hear, hear the notes better. <laughs> That's, that's under speed. I would probably play it faster than that. But if you're playing it slowly, if you're playing, say, at half speed, then the trill should only be at half speed. The trill should not be full speed. So a lot, one big mistake that pianists make in practicing is they'll practice slow, slowly, you know, like, say, maybe half speed or three-quarters speed, but yet the trills remain as fast as they can play them. So you need to know how to slow down trills to the, the correct speed of the music. And Bach explains it pretty easily here. Usually, I, most trills, I would say 90% of the time, or at least 80% of the time, they, they fall into groups of eight, 
which is in, if you have the quarter note as a beat, it'll, it'll be 30 second notes. If, if it's in cut time, the trill notes will be more um, the eighth notes, uh, or no, 16th notes. So a trill in a cut time piece, the trill notes will probably be 16th note, the equivalent of 16th, whereas in 4-4 four, four, or 2-4 four time, in a common time, they'll most likely be in, in 30 second notes here, because they're usually in groups of eight, at least most of the ones in duple meter. Sometimes, occasionally, maybe depending on the speed, you might want to put three trill notes in the right hand for one left hand note, but usually it usually it's like two for one. It's almost never four for one. So there we have a part here. Oh, G, let's turn to the G. Bach inverts the subject here. It's a nice subject. The subject is as a jig. It's actually like a fugue. It's a jig in the style of a fugue or a fugue in the style of a jig. <laughs> and then in the second half, he takes, he takes that and he inverts it. And there we have the trill, measure 34. This is what I wanted to get at that. Also, it's usually trill with termination. He doesn't indicate it like he does here, but he has a squiggly line with a trill, and then he actually writes out two 30-second notes for the termination. So in essence, what you're playing here, if you play this literally, you're playing exactly what he has here. So he's just notating it a little bit differently. But this trill starts from the upper note because the note previously is not the upper note. So. example of a trill with termination, but usually he writes the terminating notes out. So whenever you see a trill with two 30 second notes written out at the end, that's always a trill with termination. And it's always an indication that Bach wanted it measured, a measured trill, measured with 30 second notes in this case. So you don't want to go... Try to play the trill as fast as you possibly can play it. Has to be measured. Let me give you a tip. One easy way, I would suggest most trills try to set the note before the trill apart from the trill. So I don't, I'm not playing. Put a little break there so if you put a little break then it's easier to attack the trill and it's easier to get velocity on the trill than if you if you, if you try to connect all of them I've, I've discovered this through experience that uh, this this applies to almost all trills in Bach. So if you have a trill and you have a note before the trill, don't connect the note before the trill to the trill, unless it's a really slow and cantabile style piece, like maybe a sarabande that needs more legato in it. But especially with anything of a moderate tempo to a fast tempo, consider setting that note apart from the trill, and it will be much easier to play the trill that way. Turn, okay, let's look at the turn here. Uh, turn, well, these are all over the place. Uh, first of all, we can look at the Goldberg variations for this here. Uh, let's look at the aria, the aria of the Goldberg variations. Uh, of course, 
has some uh, very famous uh, turns in there. Look at measure six. So we have, here's measure five and measure six. And that's exactly what he says here, the turn. So that's from here. So the turn is just four 32nd notes played like that. So there's that's the note, the main note is F sharp. So turns are gonna start above, go below, and go back up. It's gonna do that. And then the next note in the next measure is G. So it's just gonna be, it's gonna be like that. So that's a famous turn in the aria of the Goldberg Variations. You can also look at Variation 16. I chose this because there's some in the left hand. Uh, 37 and 38. Actually, let's look at 35. Because, okay, if you look at measure 35 has in, in a trill with termination. So we have, like we just did, so we have in measure 35 in the right hand, we have that. Now we go on, I'll play. Now listen. Ah, he has a turn in the alto voice. So it's tricky to play because you have to hold this E down. And then, and I would suggest the fingering, I would suggest two on the F sharp and then play the turn three, one, two, one, three. So you can reserve your second finger for the black key. And that's very common for trills. Try to avoid your thumb on a black key if you can. Occasionally, it's you have to play your thumb on a black key. But in this case, here's a good example where you wouldn't want to play your thumb on that black key. Because a turn is very easy with three, one, two, one, three, with two on the black key on F sharp here. So, and then what's, what I like about this is now he throws in turns in the left hand. So in the next measure he has, same thing, it's just four notes. And this, the turn is on the G, so you're gonna start the turn on the A. And then in two measures later, has a turn on A, has the same thing, but a step higher. So I like this passage, so I'll play this whole passage here from measure 35 to uh, like 42 or something. Okay, so we have... I just love these. <clears throat> Another thing, let me emphasize this again. I'll emphasize it again. So, don't connect. Don't do it legato, staccato. Those are all legato, but then the last note of the turn is staccato, and then you hear it. So, yeah. sound there. So you have Love that. Let's look at the ascending trill next. The ascending trill is the fifth one over here. Ascending trill, well, you can see this little hook that goes from the bottom and it goes upwards. It ascends. That means that literally you're going to start the trill from below the main note. So the, the note, it would have, if C is the main note and that has the ascending trill on that, then we have, we have that. But there's no termination on it. There's no termination like, so it's not, it's not, 
it's not it's not like that but it's just it's that now uh, let me find i found an example of that in the french suites so let's look at the french suites uh, suite number two in the air and this is measure eight and i'll play it slowly going on here. Let me do that again. So what we have is we have first we have just a simple trill to begin with and be, because the note before the trill is the note above the trill, the trill is on B flat I like to start this trill. I like to just play a simple prowl triller starting from B flat. I don't, I don't like to, to uh, repeat that C. It just sounds redundant to me. But then when you get in here, after you play that A and set that A apart, like I said, so don't play. Don't connect the A but but set the A apart from the trill. Descending trill. Right here, right here is a descending trill. So the trill, that little sign is on G. So you're gonna start from A and sweep downwards. So, and like before, don't go, <laughs> don't do that. And this is a good example here where I would use that same fingering as that three, one, two. So I use three, one, two, Three one two one, and then the main trill is with three one. So you reserve two for that F sharp. If you want to, if you can fit, if, if you have thin fingers, you could you could do that as well. You could just go one. You can use one on F sharp two three, but it, it depends on your hand. If you have large fingers, fat fingers. Uh, or, or you can't fit your fingers between the black keys very well, then I would suggest three, one, two. So fingering also has to do with the, your particular anatomy and how your hand is shaped. So there we have a descending trill, and those are all over the place here. I think in this, in this aria, he does it a few more times. Ascending trill with termination. Okay, so now we're on the next line here. Ascending trill with termination. Let's look at partita number six, uh, the G, 26. Measure 26. So he, once again, just like in partita number four, you know, the, he'll, he inverts the subject. So, so the subject in the beginning goes like this. has a simple trill so he has he just has a like a trill like the very first trill here just a normal trill with no termination or anything on it but then when he inverts the subject and bear in mind this is under tempo okay so I'm not playing it like it's supposed to be played so sharp with the the little hook starting on the bottom it goes up and he has a squiggly line and then he has a a little more than side of termination on there i know it looks really confusing but basically it's just you just play what's here so you're going to start you don't the trills it's on f sharp so you're going to start on e you're going to go how that trill would be. Uh, D 
descending trill with termination, the next one over, um, I don't know. I looked and looked. I couldn't find one, but I'm sure you get the idea. So let's go to the appoggiatura from below. Let's look at the Goldberg aria, uh, measure 16. I'm going to play measures 15 and 16 here. So that is an, called an appoggiatura. They're often indicated with a small note. So in this case, in my score, in most, most Urtex editions, have the appoggiatura as a very small note, like looking like a grace note. If there is a little grace note, and there's a little line through the grace note, technically that's supposed to be an acciacatura. Acciacatura, hard to spell. So an acciacatura is when the note is played quickly before the beat. So that would be like, uh, I'll play this like an acciacatura. So it would be like, that. it looks like that, but actually it's. So appoggiaturas, first of all, do not have a line through the small note. And second of all, they're, they're played on the beat. So the actual note that, that is on the beat, it will be not have its full value. Like this is a half, that's a half note D, but it's really gonna be like, it's really going to be a dotted quarter note D with the appoggiatura filling one, the time of one eighth note, so. So all of those little small notes in the aria, and you'll see these all the time. In the beginning, we have, we have, we have, we have appoggiatura, appoggiatura. It's not, but it's. So appoggiaturas usually indicate or implies some kind of an expression to it. So instead of here, da, 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 da. so it's not. See, so you don't want to give them all the exact same weight. So there's a certain way to play appoggiatures. They're always played from loud to soft, loud to soft. So we have at the end of this half. So you wouldn't want to go. That, that's a bad. <laughs> no, I don't think anyone would do that intentionally. But I do hear that from performers from time to time. So be careful about appoggiatures. Uh, going appoggiatura from below, the one that goes up. They're also indicated with these little lines, this, this little bow looking line, although it's harder to indicate that. So, and they tend to be missed with the eye. So usually the standard way of notating our appoggiaturas is, is simply a small note, but they, also be aware of these because in box music you will see these appoggiatura from below and an appoggiatura from above. Measure 20 is a good example where we have an, an appoggiatura from below, but it's indicated with small notes, with, with like the grace note looking notes. So it's not, it doesn't have these little curvy, uh, curvy lines there. So measure 20 is We have a, a rising appoggiatura, and notice how I'm playing loud to soft, not not soft to loud. So so s loud soft, and then and then a between note, sort of like a passing tone, and then 
And then we have an appoggiatura from above, or a falling appoggiatura. And the reason why they're, they're at different speeds is that this appoggiatura and that appoggiatura, this, the second appoggiatura, the one that goes down, is in the course of a half note. And so you will modify the speed of the appoggiatura based on the note value. So it, it won't, it wouldn't be, but it would be, it would be that, okay? So those, that's a really good example of where you can find one measure that has both of those, an appoggiatura from, from below, an appoggiatura from above. But remember, most of the time you'll see these as small notes. And the small notes technically should not have a line through it. The line through it, the one with the small notes with the little line through it, acciaccaturas, are these sort of traditional fast grace notes played before the beat. Sometimes you will have an appoggiatura, but they'll accidentally put a line through it, or vice versa. So you have to be very careful about, uh, you know, not all editions, even even good Vortex editions sometimes will misprint appoggiaturas and acciaccaturas. Sometimes they get those mixed up. Appoggiatura and mordant at the same time. And here we have, once again, the aria from the Goldberg Variations, measure eight. So let's look at measure eight. Oh, I love this place here. <laughs> Play it without the mordant first. I'll take it from the measure before that, measure seven to measure eight. Hear how it's that F sharp's an appoggiatura, and that F sharp. Since it's played on the B, that appoggiatura should be played with the B in the tenor voice. I know they're not aligned properly, but you have to learn that even though they're not aligned vertically, the appoggiatura will be played on the B, which usually means it's going to be played with the left hand note. So, so it's not, it's not that, but it's, but it's that with that, that B and the tenor. Now, all you have to do with the, with the mordant, you just add a mordant. So it's, that's what they call appoggiatura and mordant. So once again, this measure because you, you just hear you hear it here and then you hear it in the left hand but once again don't play the mordants too fast don't play yeah, that's too uh, abrupt and too fast for a mordant remember you need to play it to the speed of the music but you don't want this either you don't want to go that's, that's a little slow it's a little too slow for that more than so. You want, you want to get just the right speed for the for the ornament. So very often when I practice, I'll just go over a couple measures and I'll just go over it like 10 times and sort of just try to tweak it to where I think it sounds right. And it's going to sound different to everyone, but you need to tweak it to make it sound right. Appoggiatura and trill. French suite number two, measure eight. Okay. Oh yeah, it's in the Sarabon, by the way. I didn't write Sarabon here, but I meant Sarabon. Uh, seven and measure eight. I'll first play it without the trill. So we hear it out. We have a small F. 
going to an E flat. So the F is the appoggiatura. And as as on the in the table here, we're gonna play it. So that gets a little extra, so it's not, but it's it's that. So Basically, it's like a trill from the upper note, but, but you're holding that upper note a little bit longer. And I would probably, I would put those together, so. I would do that. You'll also often see the same thing, see it says the same as number 12. This is another way of notating that. So whenever you see a squiggly line like a trill, and you see a straight vertical line, little vertical line before the trill, that's the appoggiatura and trill. And I'll show you where that's notated. In fact, uh, I believe it is notated that way in Goldberg aria measure 12. I'll start from measure uh, 11, measure 11. So it's not, it's not a normal trill, it's a, it's a, it's a normal trill with a longer first note to provide that that expression. That's the whole table of ornaments here. But there's one type of ornament that I think was omitted that I'd like to talk about, and it's called the Schleifer. A Schleifer is, in German, it means to slide, a slider. So a Schleifer, uh, they're, they're very common actually in Bach, and, and the Goldberg Aria has Schleifers in it. A Schleifer is a little trail looking thing uh, squiggly lines like a trill with a with a a line that goes sort of vertically upwards like that. Okay, so measure twenty three. Yeah. First you have an appoggiatura, then you have that that little sign before that A right there, little trill with a vertical line going up like that. That's a schleifer. That means you're going to take your note that it's indicated and you're going to go down a third, in this case F sharp, because the sharp's in the key signature, and you'll just sweep up to it. It's just going like that. And because it's on the beat, play, you want to play the note below it with the F sharp. So it's not, it's not that, but it's, but it's that. So. Measure 21, good example. It's actually an easier slide for to do. Uh, measure 21 has a G and then an appoggiatura. There are a lot of appoggiaturas in this aria, and that's one of the things that creates that expression. It's all the, the, the uh, appoggiaturas that go down and the ones that go up. Uh, the schleifer here in measure 21 is, is this, there should be a little trill with a vertical line going up. That simply means you're going to take that G, go three down, and sweep up to it, or slide up to it, hence the name Schleifer. We have the whole table of ornaments, whole table of ornaments explained in, in, in this video. And if you just simply work with this table of ornaments, and you, you only work with this table of ornaments. This is all you really need to play box, 95% of box ornaments. This is really all you really need.
And this is all you really need is this table of ornament. So thank you for joining me in this video. Stay tuned for more videos like this in the future.